Hey, David Julin here, pastor here at First Baptist Cramerton. You know, the past impacts us every day in ways that we are unaware of. We can go into towns and cities on roads, on thoroughfares, and uh, unaware that perhaps that, that 100, 200 years ago was a wagon trail, a railroad track, that the perimeters or the boundaries of many of our towns or cities, especially in, in Europe, uh, are falling along of cathedrals and forts and castles and so many of these things. I heard one recently, I'm not sure how true it is, but it said that the ox cart in the Roman world, um, they had to be a certain width for the, the wheel, the axles, and uh, for the ox to, to carry them, about the width of an ox uh, backside. And they had to be about the same because the roads were so wet and muddy that there would be ruts in them. So they were uh, around four foot eight inches. And that standard size um, seemed to carry through on and on when people were making roads and various things. In fact, uh, for most railways, uh, railroads today, uh, they're four foot eight inches. So something carries through from the ancient days of the ox carts, if that's true. When we say that Jesus died for our sins, we have to look back and see what that meant to the people at that time. What does it mean to die for your sins? What are sacrifices? What are sacrifices uh, for the altar? And how did they understand that? What was God trying to do through this? One thing, uh, David N. Stone Brewer, who's at Cambridge, uh, has an article about this, actually a sermon, which I draw much of my material from today. Um, and he points out that we're unfamiliar with the sacrificial system. I've never seen a sacrifice uh, on an altar of any animal or anything like that. Um, in fact, I don't know that I've, well, when I was young, I may have seen some pigs slaughtered or cows or something. But most of us, that's something of a bygone era that we don't see. If we think about sacrifices, we think about the New Testament understanding of spiritual sacrifices, where we sacrifice for uh, Christ. And uh, that's certainly appropriate. But how did we get to that? The sacrificial system, in Stone Brewer points out, was God's way of picturing what he was doing and how he wanted us to relate to him and sin. How does an infinite being, an all-knowing being, relate to those beings that are so far below him it's hard to even gauge? Not through paragraphs, perhaps, um, but primarily, at least initially, through pictures words and pictures, so people could take it into their heart. We can read something, but sometimes when we see it, of course, it can make it simpler and more understanding. Um, and Brewer thinks that uh, one of the ways that this is important is the role of sacrifices. And he points out that the largest country, or at least that influenced Israel so much, was Egypt. And Egypt was their southern neighbor. We don't think about Egypt as much. We sometimes think of the northern kingdoms that uh, came down and conquered Israel. But Israel's rival, Egypt, brought about a great influence on, uh, on Israel. And the Egyptian god, um, Anubis, uh, who is sometimes feared in, uh, pictured in the form of a jackal, which maybe you've seen that in movies or something, uh, this is this is compressing a whole lot of stuff into a little bit, but uh, they were supposed to take your soul or the being to uh, the hall of Osiris, uh, where you were judged of your the weight of sin in your life, the weight of sin, and that was compared to the bad, was compared to the good, and on a scale, and most, if not all, would seem to be wanting, uh, and the Book of the Dead which was from Egypt, would assume that you fail and then there would be these ways to show how to circumvent or avoid judgment in the afterlife. So that was a real influential picture 
in the time of the Old Testament. So there was nothing about God forgiving sin. There was nothing about this way to do that. And the Hebrew message that God loves his people and he is gracious and compassionate and cares for them in the way that it is was unique to all the cultures around there. In fact, it, this is, I, I'm prejudiced about this, of course, but it seems to me that many of the other religions were looking around and seeing how the world worked and then projecting that upon their religion. We see in the Hebrew religion, the, the, the origin of the Old Testament that becomes Christianity, I believe where God has revealed himself, revelation through, his, through the scriptures, through his spirit, through events and activities, God is revealing himself to us. That God is willing to forgive our sins. That's a really, really unique and radical understanding in the world at that time. Let's listen to a few scriptures. Psalm 103, 12. Sins for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. I, even I, Isaiah 43, 25. He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. But delight to show mercy. What a wonderful picture of God. He delights to show mercy for those who don't deserve it, but desire it. Okay? You have to desire the mercy. I suppose. In it to, to show faith in order for him to give you the mercy. You have to open your hands for him to show you that mercy. So through sacrifice, God is trying to convey to his people a, a message that they can understand, uh, that his ways are beyond our ways. So these symbols, these acts are what we found that uh, he has tried to convey to us through uh, this sacrificial system. One of the primary ways he did that was in what was called the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement was where there would be a sacrifice that day <clears throat> for the sins of the whole nation. And two goats would be set aside. One goat was killed, and the blood from the goat, that sacrifice, was then splashed on the veil before you'd go into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later the temple, splashed on the veil. Uh, normally that's where it would stop, but on the Holy of Holy days or the Day of Atonement, the priest would go in and would go through the, the, the bread of the presence and then go through to the Holy of Holies where the, where the blood would be sprinkled there on the top of the altar and on the top of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So that was certainly in the people's minds of that were hearing everything about Jesus. Normally, the carcass of the goat that was killed would be then taken outside. Uh, that's what happened on the Day of Atonement. It was taken outside the city and burned. Normally, it was eaten. But on that particular day, it was taken outside and burned. So, then the... Uh, the priest lays his, that's the high priest, lays his hands upon the other goat and symbolizes the laying of the sins of the people on the goat. Uh, this was called the Azil goat, and some translations have it the scapegoat. So, you know, a scapegoat is somebody that uh, is given the mistakes or the sins of someone else. So, the goat, this goat, though, is not killed. It's actually taken out of the city and let loose in the wilderness as a sign that the sins of the people have been removed. Uh, verse 20 of Leviticus, when Aaron had finished making atonement for the most highly place, the tent of the meeting and the altar, he shall bring forth the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat 
and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites and all their sins and put them on the goat's head. This is a symbol. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness. So we see that this is a symbol of what God was doing to, to give the people an understanding that their sins can be forgiven. He is willing to forgive. And then we move down to verse 30. It explains us a little bit more. Beginning uh, with verse 29, this is a lasting ordinance to you on the tenth day of the seventh month. You must deny yourself and not do any work, whether native born or foreigner residing among you, because on this day atonement will be made for you to cleanse. Then the Lord, you will be clean. Then before the Lord, you will be clean from all of your sins. So all of these events are in the minds of the people when we talk about Jesus and his sacrifice for his sins. And this is really radical. It's radical that God is going to forgive. Let's look at some of the, the things that might be sort of a foretaste of that when we talk about, uh, as we talk about that things, history can dictate many of the things in the present and the future. Um, one, we see that God gave this gift to all people, even the foreigners among them can receive forgiveness for their sins. At that time, you know, tribe and who you were, that was the identity, the idea, the understanding of who you were. You were the, the people of, of Greece or the people of Rome or the people of a tribe. So the idea here is that our faith or this faith, the faith of our Lord, overcomes the identity of the tribe. And we see a foreshadowing of what is experienced in the New Testament when we talk about a new people united by faith in God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. For in Christ there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek. You see, tribes and, and our identity as a people, as a nation where we live, those things are secondary to the faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we often see the sacrificial system as barbaric. Now, this is a bit, uh, might be a little hard to hear, but the, the sacrificial system, the animals were taken, and it was a premium was put on the animals not sacrificing. They were, they were supposed to be calm, and then a very, very sharp knife was taken for these sacrifices, and a slit would be made in the throat, and they would bleed out, um, and hopefully without, you know, with the least amount of pain. Now, that may seem to be barbaric to us, but have you ever seen how our meat is processed and fixed? They may think we're barbaric for many of these things. But the point is that the emphasis was on less suffering for the sacrifice for the animal. In fact, if you were one that brought about sacrifice, you might could even be um, let go of what you were supposed to be doing and somebody else brought in. But that's not, see, there's, there's similarities, but there's differences. Jesus suffered on the cross. He suffered on the way to Golgotha. He paid a terrible price. Two goats for the sins of the whole nation, but Jesus paid the price for the whole world, for the sins in the past, the sins in the pressure, in the, in the present and in the future. The cost and sacrifice was so great, in fact, that it only needed to occur once through Jesus. There was no need for repeated sacrifices. This was the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate self-giving. John says in 1 John, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, he has an advocate with the Father. You see how that's foreshadowed in the Day of Atonement and many of the other sacrificial elements throughout the Old Testament. He had, we have an advocate for the Father. Who is he? Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So his sacrifice atoned for our sins. We're no longer held responsible for our sins in the eyes of God through his grace or mercy if we have responded in faith. Now it doesn't mean that the implications for our sins are erased. It doesn't mean that we will be sinless when we become a Christian. We're going to be uh, sinners saved only by God's grace 
until Christ returns. But we are called to remember a sacrifice has been made for that, for us. And to live out of that sacrifice. We are to aspire to live as a sacrificial people, who people who have been sacrificed for. We're to aspire to live as a forgiven people because of what Christ did. Now, we may not understand all the implications of that. You don't have to know all about the sacrificial system to understand that. But you have to know that Jesus Christ died for you. The blood of Jesus is the death of Jesus and the sacrifice for Jesus willingly. The sacrifice of Jesus willingly. We may not understand all that, but we know that the implications in this life and the next are that God loves us, God forgives us, and he died for us. We've seen, we have sung nothing but the blood of Jesus many times. And I think in our world today, that is sometimes seen as almost sort of gross and barbaric, you know, talking about the blood of Jesus. But if we really understand it, and how many times even people who think that that might be a bit barbaric and gauche and past, they understand what sacrifice is. They understand what sacrificing for them is, for people dying for them, for sacrificing for them. They understand that. And we as Christians need to, I think, take a hold again of that understanding of the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus that was shed for us. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We need to take that seriously and live in grace and grow in gratitude. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to take this belief and the understanding even more serious each and every day. We've, we've sang about it perhaps in church many times. We talk about it. It rolls off our tongues, but help the reality of it to, to, to again impact our lives. We pray now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, God bless you. Uh, come see us sometime here at First Baptist Cramerton. Take care.